Hi friends, I want to welcome you to this final session of Transformed by His Presence. It's hard to believe that we've come to our final week of studying the book of Joshua. Over the past six weeks, we have followed Joshua from Egypt to the Promised Land, from being enslaved to becoming the leader of a nation. So let's recap where we've come so far. Joshua, although he was born a slave, he later became an aide to Moses during the Exodus. Joshua was with Moses in the tent of meeting when God would speak to Moses face to face. We also discovered that Joshua was with Moses on Mount Sinai when God gave to Moses the law or the Ten Commandments. And Joshua was one of the faithful spies who was on the first reconnaissance mission into the Promised Land, and he was only one of two who came back with a good report. When Moses reached the end of his life, he then passed the baton of leadership on to Joshua. We read about it in Deuteronomy 34, excuse me, Deuteronomy 3, verse 28. God said to Moses, but commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. Under Joshua's leadership, the Israelites did in fact cross the Jordan River. As soon as the priest's feet hit the Jordan River, which was at flood stage at the time, as they were carrying the ark, as soon as their feet hit the water, the waters dried up, allowing the Israelites to cross over on dry ground. As they entered the promised land, Joshua, he led them in this first campaign as they entered the land of promise. But before they did so, they set up memorial stones and they renewed their covenant as a way to remind not only themselves, but people around them that they were committed to God, committed to serving him and reminding themselves of God's faithfulness in their life. They then fought their first battle against Jericho and were victorious. Last week, we left off with the Israelites conquering the land of Ai, only later to be deceived by the Gibeonites because they didn't check with God before they entered a contract with them. They didn't ask God's opinion before moving forward in this covenant promise with the Gibeonites. And this week, we're fast forwarding all the way to the end of Joshua, to chapters 23 and 24, as he nears the end of his life. So if you've not read this yet, I encourage you to pause the video here to go ahead and read chapters 23 and 24, and then we'll meet back here in a minute. So before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is timeless and that it is able to transform the hearts and lives of those who sit under it. I pray, Lord, that you will come and meet with me on the pages of Scripture. Give me ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to respond to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So before we dive in, let me fill in a little bit of the gap, the in-between section between where we left off last week in chapter 9 and where we pick up this week in chapter 23 and 24. And these in-between chapters, it tells or recounts the conquest of Canaan. Joshua, he lists out all the different kings and the kingdoms that the Israelites defeat. And then he goes on to lay out the distribution of land, the allotment that each tribe would inherit after defeating so many different cities in Canaan. And today we fast forward to Joshua chapter 3 as we pick up the story beginning in verse 1. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, their leaders, their judges and officials, and said to them, I am very old. 
You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you. You will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Joshua, you see, he is nearing the end of his life. He gathers together all the, the nation's leaders because he knew that a change of leadership was imminent. A divine baton pass, if you will, was getting ready to take place. Just as Moses had passed the baton on to Joshua, now Joshua was going to be passing the baton on to this next generation of leaders. He wanted to give them final words of wisdom as well as warning, ensuring that he didn't fumble this baton pass. He begins by reminding the leaders of God's faithfulness his deliverance, as well as his generosity. He then says in verse 6, Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. This command that we read in chapter or verse 6 to be strong, it's reminiscent of our first chapter when we opened the book of Joshua. Four times in chapter 1 alone, Joshua says to the Israelites, Be strong and courageous. God knew then that the people were going to face some difficult days ahead of them. He knew that there would be times of uncertainty, times in which fear would sort of well up inside of them. And he wants to repeat this command to this group of leaders because Joshua knew that he wasn't going to be around and that they too needed to be strong and courageous because although they had taken a majority of the land, they still had more land to conquer. Today, I don't know if you can see it or not, I wore my Joshua 1-9 t-shirt, Be Strong and Courageous, because I thought it was kind of appropriate on our last session together. So after Joshua tells the leaders to be strong and courageous, the first thing that he does afterwards is to remind them of God's faithfulness. We read in verse 14, Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. That's a, another way of saying I'm about to die. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. You see, this baton of leadership was being passed to the next generation of leaders, and they needed to be reminded of that, that God is a promise-keeping God. If he said it, he'll make good on it. You can bank on it. And this is something that you and I need to hear and to be reminded of as well, that God is a promise-keeping God. If he promises us something in his word, then we can bank on it. Joshua then offers them a word of warning. In verse 16, he says, If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and you go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. In other words, when you choose to go your own path, when you choose to, to off-road and not to go the way that God is calling you to, it doesn't typically end well. And this is what Joshua is reminding these leaders of because he knows that as the leaders go, so the people go. We see that in life as well with parenting and leadership at a job, wherever we are, so the leaders go, so the people go as well. As we open chapter 24, this final chapter of Joshua, Joshua then gathers the people together once again at Shechem. You might have recalled or remember from last week, we talked about Shechem and this 
place that allowed all the people to be able to hear because the acoustics were so good. And there was the mount of blessing on one side, the mount of curses on the other. And Joshua, he gathers not only the leaders, but everyone to this place. We read in verse 1, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. You see, unlike in chapter 23, when it was just the leaders, now Joshua, he's gathering everyone, leaders and common folk alike, governors and stay-at-home moms. He wanted to ensure that his message would be carried out by all people. And so he repeats much of what he says in 23, he repeats it again in verse 24. And this reminds me of, of when my kids were little and my daughter had come to the age of, of being able to babysit and I would leave her in charge for a little bit when I would go to the store. I would first, I would pull my daughter aside and I would give her all the instructions of how I wanted things carried out. And after I was certain that she understood what needed to take place, I'd then invite her brothers, my two sons, into the room and then I would repeat to them the instructions that I wanted to be carried out, that she was in charge and that they were to do certain things while I was gone and to not do certain things while I was gone. And this is kind of the feel we get here, that, got, that Joshua is laying out the instructions for the leaders and then he's repeating it to the Israelites themselves, to everyone. And Joshua, he does a really amazing thing afterwards. He does something that is really um, something that we all need to take note of because he provides the Israelites a greater vision for their lives than simply just gaining land. Although that was important, this was part of their inheritance. Joshua, he wanted them to see that something much greater was at play. He shows them that they're part of a divine drama being played out on the pages of history. And starting with Abraham, he recounts to them how they had come to be in this place of blessing, how they had come to be in the promised land. And Joshua lays out for them how from one generation to the next, a divine baton pass has occurred from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, from Jacob to his 12 sons, the tribes of Israel. And even when it seemed like the baton pass had, had been dropped and all was lost during those 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God raises up Moses, who would then pick up the baton and run with it as he led the Israelites to the border of Canaan. Moses then passes the baton on to Joshua. And now Joshua was passing the baton on to the next generation of leaders. These would be the people that would run the next leg of the race that God would use to bless all peoples on earth. What most of us, I think, I don't think most of us realize is that like the Israelites, we too have a leg of the race to run. We too have a part in God's divine drama and blessing all people on earth. We read in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Years ago, God gave me a picture of this, this idea of this divine race occurring. He gave me a picture of it in my mind, a vision in my head of, of walking up the hill onto a track, a kind of like a track that you might see at a high school. And there were all these runners running past me on the track. And as I made it up onto the track, no sooner did I arrive on the track and see all of these runners running and training that I was knocked down 
knocked down by all the runners running past me, zooming past me. And I, I remember falling down and, and all of these sort of those gravels that get in your knees, you know, the old timey tracks, they have much nicer ones today. But I got up and I sort of brushed off the gravel from my knees. And the thought occurred to me that I didn't even know that there was a race going on. Not until now. People had obviously been running. People had been training hard for quite some time, but somehow I had been unaware of it. But now I knew. Now I knew that there was a race taking place and at which point I began to run. If somewhat clumsily, I still began to run at that point. And I think this is the case for many of us. We go throughout our lives doing our own thing, going our own way, with little to no thought of the call of God on our life, without any realization that there is actually a race occurring and that we have a leg in that race. You see, it doesn't matter at what point we make it onto the track. Like me, you, you might fumble up onto the track. It doesn't matter if we become aware of the track at eight years old or at 88 years old. What matters is that once we become aware of it, we must run. None of us know how long our journey will last. We can't put off for tomorrow the call of God for today. None of us are promised tomorrow. We have to be faithful with what is in front of us, which leads me to our first key point for today. Don't put off for tomorrow the call of God for today. What is it that God is calling you to? What is that thing that's been weighing on your heart, that idea in your mind, and you feel this prompting in your spirit to move forward? Perhaps it's just the call of God to say yes to him, yes to a relationship with him. Whatever our call is today, don't put it off until tomorrow. As we seek to follow God, we need to know that there's going to be times that we get knocked down, times that the training will be difficult and we'd just rather give up, and times that other runners, they, they run past us, people who've been running for years, who, who run, have been running longer or who run faster. We need to learn from these people, train alongside of them. You see, Joshua, he knew that this divine baton pass was getting ready to occur. He knew that much more was at stake than merely the Israelites receiving a plot of land. Instead, there was a divine drama being played out on the pages of history. And he and the Israelites were just only one part of that plan. Like Moses, like Joshua, and even like the Israelites, we each have a leg of the race to run. Sometimes it's hard for us to identify with people like Moses or, or someone like Joshua, but like the ordinary people of Israel, the everyday people, God was calling them to play a leg of this race as well. This race that we're running, think of it more in terms of a marathon instead of as a sprint. We're in it for the long haul, and we need to pace ourselves accordingly. As such, just like if we were training for a race, we need to enter into training. We must do the things that's going to build up our faith muscles, that's going to help us to run with perseverance the, the race marked out for us. And this doesn't happen overnight. This happens over years of training. We need to be practicing spiritual disciplines like reading the Word of God, cross-training with prayer and with fasting. We need to be going to church on Sunday and joining with others in worship. Join a small group, have a time of accountability, a time that we can say to others what we've been learning and hear from them how God has been speaking to them. I like to refer to, to small groups as the petri dishes for spiritual growth. It provides the, just the right environment for us to be able to grow. And then lastly, we need a good coach. 
a mentor, somebody who's going to help train us up, that's going to cheer us on and encourage us along the way. Which leads me to our second key point for today. Run your leg of the race with purpose, courage, and discipline. Verse 12, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. In other words, Joshua, he's reminding the people, not only the leaders, but the people of Israel as well, that they were not the reason for their success. God was the one who brought them success. This Joshua calls the people then to make a choice. He says, you've seen how God's been faithful. You've seen how he's led you every step of the way. Now you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice to follow him. He says in verse 15, this is a passage I think that many of you may be familiar with. He says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see, like the Israelites, we're not going to just fall into serving God. We're not gonna just naturally drift toward him. The pull of the world is too strong. Instead, it must be a daily decision, a daily choice to, to forego the ways of the world and instead choose to follow after God. We must choose to be in worship when we'd rather go to the lake. Choose to get up earlier and to spend time in the Word and when we'd rather sleep in. We must choose to forgive when we rather nurse a grudge or choose to turn the other cheek when we're insulted or choose to thank God even in the midst of a storm or choose to tithe when I'd rather hold on to my money. And Joshua, he makes his choice known to the people. He says to them, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We need more families like this today. People who will lead the way. People who will push back against the tide of culture. People who will say, you all can do what you want, but as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. Which leads me to our third key point for today. Following God is a daily choice. As Joshua's final act with the people, he leads them in a covenant renewal service a service in which they once again affirm their commitment to follow God. In many United Methodist churches, we have, we hold the first January, the first Sunday of each January as a covenant commitment service, a time for us to recommit ourselves to God, to follow in his ways and to do the things that he's calling us to do. As part of that service, many times we might read Wesley's Covenant Renewal Prayer, and we've included that prayer in the description link at the bottom of the video. And then we come to our final verse together today, verse 29. It says, After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 and they buried him in the land of his inheritance. Can I say that this is hard to say um, goodbye to Joshua, 110 years old, a, a life well lived. As I think about Joshua, I'm reminded of my grandmother who made it almost to 103, and she was certainly someone who had a life well lived, someone, a model of fate, someone that we could emulate and look up to. And this has been Joshua for you and I, and for the people of Israel as well. He had been faithful to God his whole life, not perfectly, but consistently. And that's what God calls for us as well, 
that we are consistent in our faith walk. And we can learn a lot from Joshua as we see God transform this man from slave to the leader of a nation. I want to encourage you that just by being here these past six weeks or so, that your faithfulness, it matters. It matters to God and he will reward you. To be in the word and to seek and to know him is definitely one of the ways in which we show our commitment to God. And God sees that and he honors it. As we end this study of Joshua together, I am gonna miss our weekly time together. But let me say that like the Israelites, we're going to face some difficult times in our life, times in which it feels like fear is just welling up inside of us, times in which we feel overwhelmed, times in which it seems like there's giants in the land, things that are going to be really difficult for us to overcome. It's at times like these I want to leave you with the words of Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. I know I have. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me and share with me some of what you have gotten out of this past six weeks of study together. Thanks for joining me. I hope that you've received not only an overview of the book of Joshua, but also some real some study tips to help you to begin to open the word and to learn how to read the scripture and to study it for yourself. May God bless you on your journey. And don't forget, be strong and courageous because God will be with you wherever you go.